we're going to be looking at the I am statements of Jesus. And there are seven of these, and they're all found in the Gospel of John. So let's open our Bibles to John's Gospel and begin to work our way through this overview. This is just going to be an overview of the I am statements of Jesus. Um, these are statements of Jesus in which Jesus uses ego I me, I am, followed by a predicate to communicate something about himself that he wants us to know. There are seven of these statements and we're going to read them in the Bible and I'm going to address each one briefly. And again, this is just an overview of the I am statements of Jesus because there's no way that we could possibly speak fully on all seven of these just in one service. But I do think it's important that we know all seven of these and then perhaps in a future service we might go back and expound upon them a bit further. But I wanted to at least give an overview because I'm not sure if I've ever preached on all of these together. I've done a lot of preaching down through the years on how Jesus is the bread of life and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and the resurrection and the life and how that Jesus is the true vine. So, so yes, we've preached messages on these topics, but I don't recall ever addressing, addressing all seven of these together in one message. I want to do that today. This is important for us to know because our Savior is telling us truths about Himself that will keep us where we need to be and not out here running to and fro in this world looking to others who are powerless to save. So let's begin. The first I am statement of Jesus is found in John chapter 6, verse number 35. We read this verse in Sunday school this morning. John chapter 6 and verse number 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And then we see also in verse number 48, I am that bread of life. What bread of life, Jesus? Well, that bread that came down from heaven. That's what he's telling us. That's what he's telling his disciples and you and I here today in 2021. And also in verse number 51, we see the Lord Jesus Christ speaking here and he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. There were those who were hearing the Lord Jesus Christ and they didn't understand what He was talking about when He spoke about the bread that came down from heaven. So He tells them plainly. He explains what He's talking about. Jesus is the bread of life because He gives life to dead sinners. He raises sinners to spiritual life. He is the one who gives salvation. He is the one who gives everlasting life. He is the one who keeps us. When a man is in his natural state before salvation, everything that he can ever possibly do only leads to death. But Christ gives life. Not only does He give life, but as bread acts as nourishment to sustain physical life, Christ is that spiritual bread that sustains the life that He gives. Christ doesn't give us spiritual life and then say it's up to you to sustain it and then it's on you to keep it. No, He gives it and He sustains it. He said, He that cometh to me shall never hunger and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. When a person comes to faith and, and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that doesn't mean that you will never have a desire for sinful things. That's not what it means. We're still struggling with sin even after we're saved by the grace of God. This flesh is still warring against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh and the two are contrary the one to the other. Galatians 5, 17. We still struggle with sin and we're going to continue that struggle so long as we're in this flesh. But what it means is when you consider 
the spiritual food that you need to sustain you, you'll understand that Jesus Christ is the only one who can sustain you and you will desire Him and no other for your sustenance from day to day. He's the bread of life. Too many people are looking to the preacher to sustain them. Too many people are looking to the preacher to keep them. They need to be trusting in Christ and Him alone. Christ is the only one. Christ is the bread of life, not the preacher. Amen. Jesus has come to give of Himself so that men and women may live by Him. And in order to partake of this bread, well, you've got to repent and believe the gospel. In order to partake of the bread of life, you've got to come to faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. In order to partake of the bread of life, you must be born again. You've got to come to faith in Christ. This is talking about a total self-commitment. That's something we don't see a lot of today. It's talking about a total commitment. Halfway, won't do it. Holding back, won't do it. It's just not going to cut it. It's, this is total commitment. That's what the Christian life is, friends. The Christian life is a life of total commitment and complete surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. There was nothing partial when God gave eternal life. He didn't give it to you partially. So we can't receive Christ partially. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, not only, not only does He give you eternal salvation, but He refreshes the soul. Anybody in here need their soul refreshed today? Christ the bread of life is the one who can do that for you. He refreshes the soul. He is the bread of life. We need to know this today so that we won't be caught looking to something else or someone else to do for us what only Jesus can do. He said, I am the bread of life. And then we find in John chapter 8, we see the next I am statement of the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 8 and verse number 12. Here's what Jesus says in John chapter 8 and verse number 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He's the light of the world, he says. When you read and study the Old Testament, we see God described in the Old Testament as a light to His people. The psalmist said in one place, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And then we see in Psalm 84, 11, the Lord is described as a sun and a shield. And what this means is that the light of His presence, in that light, there is found grace and peace. And this grace and peace is available to those who are trusting in Him. You'll find this nowhere else, only in the Lord. So Jesus Christ being the Son of God, the living Word incarnate, He embodies this Old Testament language of the light. He says, I am the light of the world. Even before Jesus came in the flesh, John had previously stated that the life which He eternally possessed was the light of men. That's what John said. In the beginning was the Word, right? Right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And He possessed this eternally. And now, because He has come in the flesh, it can be said that the true light has come into this world to illuminate this world. We've got to understand this today because there's two states that you're in. There's only two states that you can't be in. You are either walking in the light or you're walking in darkness. We can't be both. It can't be one or the other. There's no gray area, right? You're either walking in the light or you're walking in darkness. And because the true light, Jesus Christ, has come into this world, the sons of darkness and the sons of the light, they have to declare themselves for who they really are. Because Christ, the light of the world, has come to illuminate and His servants are appointed as lights to the nations. 
That's why Jesus said in another place, He said, I am the light of the world. But you see, He appoints His servants as lights to the nations also. So therefore, He's able to say in another place that ye are ye the light of the world. Because Christ is our Lord and Master, He has appointed those who know Him as lights. If you're a child of the light, you'll come to Jesus and you'll follow Him. Those who reject Him and they don't follow Him, well, they just remain in darkness. There is no other light than the light of the world. And the light that He imparts is life-giving. This is important because unless we understand these things, there's nothing but death and darkness. So without Christ as that life-giving light, the only destiny that awaits is an eternal hell. But with Jesus as that life-giving light, we can praise Him forever for all that He's done to redeem us and to make us free. He said, I am the light of the world. Christ is not only the author of and the giver of light by nature, the fact that He is the one who created the sun and the moon and the stars... He created this universe, right? He created all things and everything. Uh, he created everything in this world. He created you. He created me. Praise God. So not only is He the author of light in the sense that He is the creator, but He's also the author of light, the light of grace to all who believe on Him, whether they be Jew, Gentile, male, female, bond, or free. Christ is the author of light to all who trust in Him. Those who are lost and undone, they need this Savior. And He is a perfect Savior. And He's also the author of the light of glory that His people will enjoy forever because He is the Lamb that will forever light that eternal state. He said, I am the light of the world. So Christ said... I am the bread of life. He said, I am the light of the world. And then we have the third I am statement of Jesus. And that's found in John chapter 10. Let's look at John chapter 10, verses 7 through 9. Where here Jesus tells us, He says, I am the door. I am the door. John 10, verse number 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The door has to do with salvation. For all who come to Christ in faith and repentance, whether it be Jew or Gentile, it makes no difference. In Christ, we are all one body of believers. Everybody who's saved, we're all in that one great big family of God. We are all in the body of Christ. We are all one. We are all united in Him. So Christ is the door into the presence of God. And we all need that door to be available to us. Because by nature we were born sinners, separated from God, alienated from God because of sin. And because of sin, we've all been barred from that holy presence of God. So when the Holy Spirit begins to work in the heart of an individual, this is one of the first truths that they become aware of. They become aware of the fact that they are condemned and defiled and they cannot draw near to God on their own. They realize their guilt before Him and how far their sin has separated between them and their God and they cannot be reconciled to God on their own. So what are we ever going to do? Well, what hope? What are we going to do? What hope do we have? Well, there is hope. The Lord Jesus has come. Jesus has come. And by His work, His finished work on the old rugged cross of Calvary, let me tell you what He did. He bridged that gulf between God and man. Amen. Hallelujah! He bridged the gulf between God and man. So when He went to the cross in our stead, He became a curse for us. And then by grace through faith in the wonderful work of Christ on the cross, we come to realize that we were afar off but now in Christ, we are made nigh by the blood. Amen. I love that old English word nigh. You'll find it in Ephesians chapter 2. It means you've been brought close. 
You've been made nigh by the blood of Christ. He said, by me, if any man enter in, he said, he, said, he shall be saved. Amen. These are precious words. We don't have some high wall that we have to scale to get into the presence of God. We just simply enter in by the door. Isn't that wonderful today? Yes. We enter in by the door. And to paraphrase A.W. Pink here, he said, Christ is the door. He's not some long, dreary passageway. He's not some long, dark tunnel that you have to walk through to get into the presence of God. No, in just one step, my dear friend, you go from being outside the door to within. In just one step. Isn't that amazing? You can find yourself inside the soul that believes God's testimony to the truth of the gospel immediately enters into the presence of God. And we all need to know that Christ is the door. Otherwise, we'll be trying to find some other way to get in. When all we really need to do is just walk right on through the door. You don't even have to knock. It's already open. The door's already open to any, any person who will just simply enter into the door. It stands open this morning. But here's the thing. You'd better come in now. You'd better enter the door now because one day the door will be shut. And the day of salvation will be over and the day of God's wrath will come. Christ is the door. And if you've never came in by the door, you need to do so now. Now will be the best time. And then we see the fourth I am statement of Jesus. It's found in John chapter 11, where Jesus says, or excuse me, right here in John chapter 10, same chapter, just a couple of verses down, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Look at John chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. Here Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, for the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Good Shepherd, all of the care of our souls, each and every person sitting in here right now who's saved by the grace of God, the care of your soul and my soul, it's all being committed to Jesus Christ. He's the Good Shepherd. He takes care of you. He takes care of me. As the Good Shepherd, He takes care of all of us. If you're saved, if you've repented of your sins and you've believed in Jesus, you're one of His sheep. He came for you. He died for you. He rose for you. He, he's, come, he's going to take care of you. He's going to come back for you. He's doing it all for you. He's provided you good pasture. He protects you from enemies. He heals our diseases. He restores our souls. The Good Shepherd does these things. True care of the sheep comes through ownership. If you're saved by the grace of God, you belong to Him. If you're saved by the grace of God, you're not your own, my friend. You've been bought with a price. You belong to Jesus. You belong to Him. Those who have no right over the sheep, they're going to flee when the danger comes. But Jesus gives His life for the sheep. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't flee? He gives His life for the sheep. Now, the Bible talks about the thief. The thief may have some plans for the sheep, and those plans are going to be malicious plans, but the good shepherd's plans are based on his desire for their well-being. We've got a good shepherd who desires our well-being. F.F. Bruce said he's not content that they, the sheep, should eke out some bare and miserable existence. He wants them to live life to the full, to have plenty of good pasturage and enjoy good health. Now, the hireling is different. 
The thief, there's a thief and there's a hireling. The thief may have malicious plans for the sheep, but the hireling, although his plans may not be malicious like the thief, he's only there for the money. He doesn't care about the sheep. He doesn't have the care that the shepherd has. He does his duty as long as things are going to run, going along just fine. As long as everything's flowing the way it ought to flow, as long as it's easy going, that hireling will be right there doing his duty. But when the going gets tough, what happens? He flees. Because he's more concerned about himself than he is the sheep. He's not going to risk his own life to stand up against that wolf. He's not going to risk his own life to protect the sheep from their enemies. But the good shepherd, he protects the sheep. He fights for the sheep. He cares for the sheep. And the good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. And the good shepherd knows his sheep. And this is important for you and I to know today because otherwise when danger comes, we're going to make decisions that are based on seeking care and protection from other entities. Listen, beloved, your boss doesn't provide for you. Friend, the government doesn't provide for you. God provides for you. God is the one who takes care of us. God is the one who meets the needs of His people. We need to remember this when the tough times come so we'll look to the right one Amen. and not some hireling or thief. And then we see in the next chapter Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. John chapter 11. Look at verse number 25. John chapter 11, verse number 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Jesus was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. He was talking to Martha, the sister of Lazarus, who had just said, Lord, I know that he'll live again in the resurrection at the last day. But she was talking to the resurrection. When Jesus said, I am the resurrection... He was stating that I am the one who has the power to raise dead men to life. He is the cause of life. He gives life to all. He died that we might be dead to sin and alive unto God. When He says live, we breathe. It's because He got up from the grave that we've been begotten again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, people who are saved and believe in Jesus, they still die physically, right? I mean, we still have funeral services for believers, for people who knew the Lord, so they still die physically. But for them, the curse of physical death has been removed. For the believer, Jesus Christ has come and He has taken the sting of death away. Because He is the resurrection and the life. Because of Jesus, death becomes a blessing. Because even though they die, they will live again. Even the very dust of our bodies is under His care. They will rise again by virtue of their union with the Lord Jesus. You see, Martha knew some things prior to her conversation with Jesus, but all she knew was based on what the Pharisees taught about the resurrection. And until this point... She hadn't been able to think beyond that, but Jesus shows her that in Him, hope becomes real and hope becomes actual because when you know the Lord Jesus Christ, death is just the very moment that eternal life passes from activity to experience. The life that Jesus promises is eternal. And it's important for us to know that Jesus is the resurrection and the life because if we don't understand this, we might try to find our hope in something else, something that's powerless. So, have you believed in Jesus? Have you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? If you have, they might still put you in a coffin one day. 
Even if you believed in Jesus, they might still put you in a coffin and lay you down about six feet deep, but there's no grave that's going to be able to hold you. When you know the resurrection, you will live again. And this is more than just some resurrection at the last day. Jesus is looking ahead to His death on the cross and His rising again from the grave, and He is affirming the fact that all who believe on Him even though they may face physical death, they're going to share in His rising again because they are united to Him by faith. Are you united to Jesus by faith today? He's the resurrection and the life. If you are united to Jesus by faith, you're going to rise again because He's the resurrection. And then we see in John chapter 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let's look at John 14, verses 5 and 6. Thomas saith unto him, Thomas is going to ask the Lord a question, and one day when we all get to glory, each and every one of us ought to go find Thomas and thank Thomas for asking this question. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. So Thomas asked the Lord a question here that gave Jesus an opportunity to expound on some things that he had already taught. You see, as they saw it, the disciples, they saw Jesus as the way to the Father. He is the only way that men and women will ever get to the Father. There is no other way. And if anybody ever tries to tell you that there's another way, you need to shut that person off because they're lying to you. He is the only way. And people today will hear such a statement and they will come away being offended by that. They'll say, well, that's, that's exclusive. That's terribly exclusive. But we've got to keep in mind that it wasn't just some mere man who made this statement. No, it was the Word of God incarnate who made this statement. This is the Word incarnate talking here. So when you understand that all of God's truth and all of God's life is incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ, then your perspective will begin to shift from exclusive to inclusive. Because we have the self-revelation of the truth of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. And without the life, there is no living. He is the way that we must follow. He is the truth that we must believe. He is the life for which we must hope. And if you go His way, you'll know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Jesus was explaining to Thomas here as well as the rest of us. We're not excluded from this. He's talking to us in His Word here. That to get to God, the Father, we must know Christ. And the disciples had already begun to know the Father because they came to know the Son. And this is important for you and I to understand because Jesus is not just somebody who points the way. He is the way. No church is going to bring you in. No ceremony is going to bring you in. Only Christ. Neither you have Christ or you don't. Jesus isn't just some man who tells the truth. He is the truth. Thank you, Lord. He's just not some man who happens to be alive. He is the life. He is the author of life. He is the source of life. I like what old J. Vernon McGee said about this verse a long time ago. He was talking about a student he met on campus one day at UCLA. 
And the student walked up to J. Vernon McGee and said, you know what, I don't really like the Bible because it's filled with dogmatism. And J. Vernon McGee agreed with him. He said, yes, it is filled with dogmatism. And he especially selected this verse where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, that's dogmatic. And J. Vernon McGee said, it, it, it sure is dogmatic, but you've got to realize that it's characteristic of the truth to be dogmatic. Truth has to be dogmatic. But not all dogmatism is true. Some people are dogmatic over ignorance. But where Jesus is concerned, friends, there are millions and millions and millions of people who have, who have come to Him on the basis of His statement right here in John 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And they will not be disappointed. We're going to find Him to be exactly that. If you've yet to come to Jesus in your life, please do that today. Let me hurry on here. The last of these I Am statements is found in John chapter 15 where Jesus says, I am the vine. I am the vine. Look at John 15, verse number 1. We'll get ready here in a moment, come to a close. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. I hope this is a blessing to you all today. Amen. It's brought joy to my heart to be able to reflect on these I am statements of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father tends to the vine. He removes the unfruitful branches and He prunes the fruitful branches so that they can bring forth more fruit. And that vine is an Old Testament figure of Israel. Israel was the vine that God had brought out of the land of Egypt and He had cleared out a place for it. And in Psalm 80, verse number 8, the Bible says, Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. But Israel had failed time and time and time again. But now Jesus comes along and Jesus has proven Himself to be everything that Israel failed to be. He has produced acceptable fruit before God in His own personal life as well as in the life of His disciples because they were united to Him by faith. If a branch has no fruit, then that's going to cast some real doubt as to whether or not that branch abides in the vine. I've got an apple tree, and I was standing out in the yard there yesterday. One of my little kittens had gotten out, and that's one of the first places I go to look for when she's missing is in the top of that apple tree. And I was standing there, had, had a flashlight looking up in the top of that apple tree, and I can tell you this from firsthand experience that there's some branches that may look like they're united to the vine. which is the main stem, the tree trunk in this case, but they don't have any fruit. All the other branches around them may have fruit, and there can be certain branches that do not have fruit even though they appear to be united to the vine. And the reason they have no fruit is because they're not really in the vine. It's one thing to look like a Christian and to talk like a Christian, and to act like a Christian. And it's something else entirely to actually be in the vine. Because there's going to be a whole lot of people who went through their lives acting like they knew Jesus, but they didn't really know. And it's not our identification with the church. It's not our identification 
with a ceremony that's essential. What is essential is your identification with Jesus Christ. Amen. So these are the seven I am statements of Christ. May we learn these and may we know them because when we know Jesus and we know the things that He taught concerning Himself, we honor Him, we glorify Him, and we show that, he, that we know that He is the only one who is powerful enough to save us and He is the only one who is powerful enough to keep us and He's the only one who can lead us into the presence of God. Let's all pray this morning. Father.